fantastic. Stick it out here. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started because we got to get started. This conference is going to end. There's going to be the final wrap up in one hour. Um, thank you for hanging out and being here. We appreciate it. We wondered how many people would show up. Um, the last session of me needing to travel. I'm Deborah Steelmaker. I'm Amy Steelmaker, the <laughs> daughter. You saw Maisie Archer, the daughter, yes. Um, <laughs> And our session today, as we mentioned in our trailer this morning, is about building online uh, community uh, through the discussions. And first of all, I'll take credit and blame for us <laughs> doing this session. Um, last year when I attended this conference for the first time in Boise, I said, oh, I really love that conference. And I heard a lot of angst about doing discussions. I went back to this last year at my institution, Utah State University, where there was a lot of angst about doing discussions. And... I was in Flower's session this after, or earlier today. How many were in there? Okay. And she said, pick one word that you think about online learning. Does anybody want to share theirs? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody? Uh, yeah? Excited. Excited. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And my word was liberate. I love it. It's liberating to me. Doesn't mean it's to you. But it's liberating <laughs> to me. And discussions to me, um, while time consuming, it really gives me a clear view into my students and what they do. Full disclosure, I am um, a faculty member at Utah State over the graduate programs. I only work with graduate students. And so that might <laughs> blur some of the enthusiasm. But I have Amy here with me, who as we were doing this presentation, she was like, I'm the anti-discussion. She's the anti-discussion. <laughs> so you are going to get lots of different viewpoints here about how to do things. So if you fall on the side of one spectrum, or you could be nudged to my side of the spectrum, we're going to give you those points of view. And it wasn't until about mm, last night, about 8 o'clock, when I totally realized that she's like, Mom, we just shouldn't be doing discussions that much. That being said, <laughs> I know that. I've included other things in my courses besides uh, discussion. So, um, yeah. That's, that's what I do at Utah State University. You want to say a little bit what you do? Yeah, so I work at Western Oregon University doing a lot of different things, but um, instructional design. So I work with mainly undergraduate instructors who are teaching undergraduates. And then I do also teach one, um, one online class for graduates, which is instructional design. And that's us at Disneyland. This summer oh, yes. because both of my girls... You can see Amy on the right there, and my other daughter, Leah, in the middle, and I was on this log room, whatever, what is it? Splash Mountain. Splash Mountain. <laughs> and <laughs> she knows where it is. Um, they both finished their graduate degrees this past year, and I said, I'm taking a girl on vacation. We're going to Disneyland. <laughs> so that's our trip this past summer. But um, she's up teaching fifth grade, so it is a family of educators. My husband says, where are the engineers? So <laughs> no engineers. Anyway, that's who we are. That's a little bit about what we do. Um, we have some session content for you if you want the slides that we have. It has some other links to other files that we'll be talking about. It's just bit.ly slash northwest elearn 19 field. Um, and it's in the SCED. It is. It's in the yeah. SCED. You know what's weird though? When I opened it on the app in SCED, it just kept opening like in a loop. Um, but if you copy and paste that, it'll be fine. I didn't know I was going to do that. And I uploaded a PDF with the link in it as well. So you have it there. So, first thing we want to talk a little bit today about is techniques for increased engagement. Um, these techniques come in all shapes and sizes, and if we take a look, we want to really first start with the good prompt, right? How many of you have taken an online course where you, not, not designed it, I'm sure you all designed awesome ones, taken an online course that didn't have a good prompt? <laughs> okay, uh, make the post something you want to read. I think these are actually going to be, Amy came up with these. Okay. I'll, I'll run them. <laughs> yes, so in my work as an instructional designer, I see a lot of prompts ranging the spectrum. So these are some, I have two examples of some maybe not so good ones. So this is from a graduate level pedagogy class. It says, after reading, after reading the designated chapters, reflect on the materials and choose five things that you find to be most appealing or interesting to you. Fail. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it fail? What's wrong with it? Yeah, what, what's going on here? It's very general. Maybe. Yes. General? Is it worth your time to discuss? Well, there's not room for discussion. Uh, I see these five things mm -hmm. and then my response to that other classmate is either, I saw them too, or... Yep. <laughs> 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 
Exactly, exactly. This is more just for yourself, right? This is kind of a journal or reflection, but peers reading this, you know, you don't really care about what other, you know, like you said, it's, um, it's just not that interesting. There's nothing really to discuss here. So you all pass. <laughs> you pass. <laughs> yes. Yep, okay, so second example. This is in a 100 level um, health class. What types of cardio exercise do you enjoy the most? Why? Ideas for exercising at home in the cold weather? Do you struggle with the weather changes or do you embrace them? What will you do this week for exercise? Discussion questions? What's wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of questions if that's one prompt for sure. Anything else? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is it yes or no? What's the cognitive <laughs> process, right? Where's the critical thinking? That discussion should really engage me, and I've got to say something about this right now. Yeah, yep, that's why it fails. <laughs> See questions? So I actually have this is another secret. Like when uh, Amy and I were putting those, and she had, by the way, she had two more slides. I had a lot. Fails. And, um, <laughs> and I could have put I more in there. I actually was sort of going through my next four weeks in my Canvas course going, okay, that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Modify some words because... You know, sometimes we're like, we want to make sure the student, we want to use the discussion to check for reading. Yeah. Use the discussion to check for them watching our videos, right? And so we find ourselves asking things that be more suited to what I call in my class a gist quiz. Are you getting the gist of things this week? A blog? Or something else that doesn't really need a discussion. It is a reading check. So I don't think I told you that, but I do go through my <laughs> questions. So what do these good prompts look like? Well, hopefully a good prompt requires critical thinking. They cannot Google the response. Mm -hmm. okay. Secondly, it relates to their experience. Now, for me with graduate classes, you know, I got a lot more experience. I got age on my side, for one thing. Nearly all of them are working. Our degree programs are all online. They're still in the field working. That is helpful. How does that work for you, for the undergrads, relating to their experience? I would say, like, they still have experiences, right? They're still doing internships or jobs or um, even growing up in their family. What did you see? Um, it can always come back to the person. Okay, so relating to student experience is a good way to, like, this, this is kind of the rubric of the prompt, so sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> are, it's immediately applicable. Like, they can take what's in there and, like, oh, this is useful to me. This is going to parlay to something else that they're doing in this class for an assignment or my work. So it's like, this is something I'm going to be able to carry out of here as a takeaway. The discussion should provide some sort of takeaway. Um, <laughs> yeah, many possible responses. I think a few of you said those are yes, no, thing five. And that's not a right answer. Right? You, don't want <laughs> that's to, not a right. you don't want to ask a question that has a right answer, because then What's it's the not stuff? right. <laughs> so I teach a reading and applying research class, which is... Uh, entry level consumer statistics class for master's level students. Highly calculated effect size is not, right, is not <laughs> a question for a discussion because, again, there is a way to do that. Um, so that's a good example. Um, set of conflict or cognitive dissonance. That is a good way to think about it. Does this set up some sort of conflict? Is there something for them to negotiate in this space? Does what, what is disagree with what should be? And that's another way to think about the question that you kind of frame it and write, write it in those kind of contrasts or even compare and, con and contrast, which is one of the essential nine teaching strategies through meta-analyses that really works. So that's another good way to do that. Um, I, I like those. When I come up with those, I'm really proud of myself. You know? <laughs> I'm really excited. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so Amy and I went back and forth about using how to have these right words inside. What kind of words would you use? And obviously, we're pretty all familiar with blooms, and you can Google ad nauseum bloom taxonomy verbs, right? And we've put a few links in the presentation. She cleaned up a lot of these terms because they were just synonyms of each other. And so these are just some words to kind of like help you like in your toolbox to pull off of each one of these levels. And of course, in a discussion, if it's knowledge level, does this thing have a point or two? No, maybe it does. Facts are probably not something you need discussion, right? This is not fair. Put that someplace else. There's other ways for me to check. Did you do the reading? What knowledge do you have? Um, comprehension? Yeah, okay, I want to see if they comprehended it. But typically, where are you working in the discussions? 
with blooms. Where are you? Yeah, the top couple, you know, two or three. And those are some words that if you're like struggling to develop your prompt, maybe you just quick, quick take a look at those. Oh yeah, that's what I'm trying to get them to do. It's just a little tool that you can have in your toolbox. When I work with faculty who have not taught online and face-to-face, a couple of them are just curmudgeons flat out, um, <laughs> they are reluctant online educators. They want me to provide them with some sentence stems. And how many of you looked at sentence stems for discussions? Have you ever done that before? So you can take some of these bloom kinds of things and you can say, at what are these levels, like evaluation, what is the most important, prioritize according to, and add some of the whys and some of those other types of verbs. So we use some of those kinds of things, but as Amy pointed out, there are limitations to these. I mean, well, the biggest limitation I found when I was looking through Blooms is there will be words that show up in, like, every single column. Discuss or, within three like, the of first, the Yeah, <laughs> define, Explain. and so it's like, what's the benefit of this? Um, so I really like this article, the link that's on there, 50 questions to help students think about what they think, which has some really good <laughs> kind of like these sentence stems that you can kind of use for to start your discussions if you're not really sure what, how to start um, something that's going to be good. To discuss. So let's say you have a journal article and you know there's some really provocative things in there, but you're like, okay, what are some ways for me to frame this in a discussion question? This could be a place for you to start, and some of you are maybe very advanced and like, this is way below you, but this is something I provide to my reluctant faculty who are just like, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to do it. So we went round and round, and, and uh, I like blues. Um, but there are some limitations, and some of it gets really simple, and if it falls in those lower categories, it's probably some, a better place to check for that somewhere else with some other tool besides the discussion tool. Anything else on that one? We had a lot of conversations about blue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll spare you guys some of those. Um, so, what am I trying to accomplish in the discussion? Is this, and it's Amy's little blurb under there, you can hardly see with this very dark projector, but is the form helping or harm. So, these are yours. Yes, sure. so some common goals that instructors have when they're making a discussion forum. One, they want students to engage with the content. They want students to engage with each other. They want people to see and learn from each other's work, right, in kind of a gallery type. You have them post their projects and then everybody looks at it. And then four, um, to feel connected, building that sense of community. And these are all viable goals, good goals to have, but I've seen, if you click to the next, some common, yeah, you can grab it, some common missteps. Um, so I put down here the goals that were on the previous slide and then some of the common problems that I see come up that are harming the goals rather than helping. So using discussions as the main method of engagement, which you do see a lot in graduate level courses, is, is a discussion every week, and that's, that's the assignment. Um, but the problem there, which we've been talking about a lot this conference, UDL, right, Universal Design for Learning, and so if that's your only or even main method of engagement, then you're not following those principles. So for example, like I, in the class that I do teach, um, instructional design, I have, I think it's... 10% of students grade that's engagement, but there's a lot of different ways that they can get those points. So it could be participating in the forums, but if you don't like that, like I didn't as a student, then, <laughs> then you could also um, like choose a more complicated project that required communicating with different stakeholders. Um, let's see what else I have on there. Oh, posting in like the um, general questions or responding, um, well, to emails, that kind of just like professional communication. There are a lot of ways to, to earn those engagement points. Mm, confusing sharing work with what did you learn? So that third goal, um, see and learn from others' work. So yeah, I think that when instructors just want students to post, you know, links to their projects there so everybody can see what everybody else is doing, I think that um, that's fine, but when I also hear instructors use this, you know, they want people to see and learn from each other's work as an excuse 
for why these questions, like what did you learn, why those are in forums, um, like that first prompt. But again, that's not, it's not that interesting to see <laughs> what other people learned. So probably not, um, not a great discussion. Requiring peer replies. Um, so I know this is, again, common practice. Um, and I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. I mean, I don't like it. But I think that when it's... It's a good cop, bad cop. When, <laughs> when it's for goal number three and four, so seeing and learning from others' work, if you're just trying to have it be like a gallery walkthrough, then why are you requiring replies? Shouldn't they be able to just browse? Um, or maybe you have, like in my class, I also have like a like button. So you don't have to like respond. But you can just be like, oh, yeah, I like that. And then if your goal is to feel connected, um, requiring peer replies is kind of counter, you know, you're forcing this connection, which isn't very, um, it's not very, very organic. Did you have a question? That was not just an arm stretch, right? <laughs> but what if you really did want somebody, pres presuming that, that it was an inform a, a well-informed post, that, that somebody had, had actually read their stuff and understood and had a little light bulb moment, get that, a piece of that same light bulb, um, yeah, well, so then what would you do? For the requiring peer replies? Or, or mm -hmm. yeah, well, well, I'm looking at the second the second square across the top, it's confusing sharing work with what the mm. Well, yeah, I want both of those to happen. I would, so, <laughs> we had this instructors, you want, right, you want that, but from a student's perspective, I'm not reading the forums like that, right? I'm not going through and like, oh, what did they learn? And let me like, you know, glean from that, I guess, this light bulb moment. It's not like we'd like to think that that's what the students are doing, but I don't know that that's really, I mean, there's some other students, like Elizabeth, you're in my class, and Sandy. Do you guys have opinions? <laughs> The boards aren't your favorite. <laughs> um, what she does do is she does put the like option so that you know that they kind of breeze by it. So what I, I like, it, again, I'm working with graduate students. I want them to be able to critically think about somebody else's so that they can either co-op it, be aware of it, change their opinion. And so I want them, I want to see that they've done that. So I do... I do like, I require, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I do require some posts back uh, so that I know that some folks read it just to see what it is. One of the things we discussed was the content of the courses, you know, how that might differ uh, in the way you set that sort of a thing for responses or not. But she is allowing for the likes so that they, they breeze through the gallery and they saw that. I have mixed emotions about those because... You know, doing likes on this person, zero on this person kind of thing. And it's like, I get a little bit twitchy about that. That's why I like to see the post and then there's nobody you know, like really taking the time other than just clicking that emoticon, so to speak. Depends, so, yeah. yeah, it depends on the... It depends on what it is a little bit. And how and what feels best to you, too, in the class? Like, what is it you really hope that they're working on? Is there one more? There's one more. Yeah. Uh, believing in spontaneous generation. So we all probably took biology class at some point. <laughs> Spontaneous generation, which is kind of expecting that, you know, in the same way that you don't want to force community, if you're just kind of like, you know, you put an open forum there and you're just kind of expecting community to spontaneously generate, people generally need something to go on, right? Something, some kind of problem to solve. Um, which is why... Okay, so I found this quote when I was looking at some things for this session a couple weeks ago, and it's, um, perhaps part of the problem is treating discussion as an end rather than a means. And so usually with forums, we have, the form is the assignment, right? But this is saying maybe, you know, the assignment is a, a group project or something like that, and then the discussion is the way, you know, the means that they accomplish that assignment. And I think that, I was just thinking about that and thought that's maybe a way to get at that kind of 
feeling connected, um, social aspect, the, that kind of goal we have. It makes it less laborious. It does. We, to, to accomplish this, we're going to be working together as a, in forming this community where we're having a conversation. So in, in my class, I have, um, I have one group project, and I had this just as a discussion area that um, I gave to each group that they could use if they wanted to, but they didn't have to, um, just to kind of organize their thoughts and that kind of thing. And I honestly hadn't looked at it until two weeks ago, but after reading that quote, I was like, hmm, I wonder if that was, if that was true in my class, if it... Um, having the discussion not be the assignment was useful or not. And so I went and looked, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, 27 replies. Um, and there's what, five students in a group, and I looked through, and the replies were, I mean, they were good. It was from all group members, and they were substantive, and it was like, oh, and that wasn't even, like, an assignment. Um, so I think that can be a way of kind of building that community is having it be a means rather than the assignment. Questions, comments, experiences on that? Could you help me understand what I'm seeing? Why, why, were there one, two, There's three, a wombat, four, a wallaby. Were, <laughs> were, were, were there five teams or, or yes. five, five groups? Yes. Each one of those avatars is a team. Yes. Okay. Yep, five teams, five students in each team, pretty much. Yeah. And all marsupials, just because, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so alternative discussion methods. Text, audio, video, I think, I mean, when I'm talking to the instructors that I help, I always say best practice to allow students to submit text, audio, video, unless you have a real good reason. Whoa, what did I just do? Um, almost. Almost. Um, for not allowing those, which generally there's not, um, then you should let students at least submit in those different ways. And then beyond that, too, considering doing some discussions that are voluntary. So I kind of talked about that. Synchronous. I know we both have done some kind of things like with Zoom um, or Google Hangouts where you're, it's that, that kind of live interaction which can help build the, that feeling of connectedness. Yeah, so on the synchronous sessions, this semester I'm, my whole online course is in project-based learning. Um, they're doing a field project for a program evaluation. A program planning, a needs assessment, and a program plan for a program evaluation. They are literally in eight different county offices across the state. And uh, they're not physically there, but they're working with county folks there. And we have synchronous sessions. I have synchronous sessions with each team. And each team is about four people. And so they're, they, they know that they've got three phases to a project, and so phase one, they meet on Zoom or something like that, and I've asked them to share that Zoom link with me, and I will check in as I am available for five minutes just to answer questions, and then they can go off on, and work on the assigned parts that they're working on that week. And that's the discussion for the week. I know they're discussing, they're working on the project. It is the means to that end. And so there's no other discussion in there. I don't need it. They're already doing it as it's discussed before. So that's a synchronous session. We're having a synchronous discussion. I'm in there five minutes. You take as long as you need to do the project, and they're gone. And that's going to get reported out in a report that they're doing for that final project. So that's another way to run the synchronous pieces. I'll be doing those two or three times with each group this, this semester. They like that, by the way. Yeah. They feel very connected to you after you do that sort of thing. Yeah. I just want to hear Amy's perspective on that from the undergraduate side. Um, more scaffolding necessary? Um, so, in my experience with synchronous, doing things synchronously when it's online has been, they, they do want it because most of the time they're on campus students, they're just taking this class online. So they're there and they kind of like want, they like still want that piece, and so they're usually like pretty excited to do it. Um, making it required and synchronous in an online class, that you could get a little bit tricky, right? Um, so, like, when I've done synchronous, it's always been voluntary. Um, I could see some students saying, you know, oh, this is online, that, you know, you didn't say that this was, that you'd be required. But generally, I, I've found that they like it. Yeah, Jeff? My experience with the, <clears throat> with the uh, voluntary synchronous meetings, mm -hmm. um, for instance, in a, um, in a uh, 
economics class, it was always the um, A students who showed up for the, voluntarily for the synchronous meetings. And it was usually like test review sessions and things like that. Mm -hmm. When people really needed the help um, for the kind of students who wouldn't go to class, it was assessed or required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why I like putting mine in program uh, research teams, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then you're the only going to do weak link, and they know they're meeting together, and they also know ahead of time that they're going to be evaluating each other's performance on that committee at the end of that project, and that's got some more stakes. So, and they set their own time for that synchronous meeting when all of them are available, so that helped a little bit. Um, I did one synchronous session where I said, it's going to be at 7 o'clock or whatever it was on Tuesday night. You two those, and it is voluntary, and I record it, but I had all but one show up for that. Again, grad students, maybe I'm, maybe I'm living in La La Land. Okay. <laughs> that's the other thing I would say is if you record, so like in Zoom, you can yeah. always record it. So that's a way to make it Accessible. required. But if people can't come at that time, it's recorded. You know, you have to watch this and, you know, maybe answer some question about it. Um, oh, panel. So you're in a class, you're with the same 20 students for the entire term. Bring in some other people some outside, you know, do a panel or like a AMA, you know, ask me anything. Um, that can also bring in a little bit more excitement, I would say, to the discussions. I did that as a guest speaker. I had a guest that night that I called Synchronous as a guest speaker on a piece of research that they were reading that semester. It's the author of that research. Filled it all up, told it what it was, and um, just did kind of a little interview in the Ellen show with them sort of thing. And I, I think that really does help. Um, anonymous, if you were in Patrick. Lowenthal's session the other day, he talked a little bit about Anonymous and how that has to be, of course, a group that you trust <laughs> that wouldn't go off the rails. But um, that can be good if you're not assessing and you're just kind of trying to build like the that community. Who's done that before, Anonymous? I never have. Anyone? I'm sorry, a question of the panel. Can I go back? Yep, oh, sure. So you said that, um, I'm sorry, is that a face-to-face -face class, hybrid? Online. online. So it was online. And so when you had the discussion, so it's alternate, alternative to, to they just watch, they want to know the, the, the prompts. No. no, I was using Zoom, mm -hmm. and um, we had a chat box open on the side, yeah. and I could see all their little faces, and they were just good. And um, mm -hmm. I have a, a, co a grad student in there, and she would post a couple of questions, and then it was just it was just really nice the way it flowed. It lasted one hour, and that was the big kind of uh, time commitment that week in addition to the readings. And was that recorded as well? It was recorded. And then, if the, actually there were two students, then they were required to do some sort of discussion, a reflection post based on that later. And you just, I, just have a, I don't really care that you're exactly there. I want you to get the content. That's what's important, right? right? Okay. Are there corporate concerns? Because um, I know I have an instructor that wanted someone else to facilitate a written discussion board. We couldn't have someone outside of OSU facilitate because there's students. Could be, but ours wasn't outside, so it was okay. This person was up and on campus off it yet. And um, I don't know that it would. What I've that heard from that with, with at least at Wu is as long as they're not assigning grades or seeing grades, rating, that that is okay. Because I know, like, I've had instructors that do, like, an AMA just in a text discussion where there's, like, an expert there, and then the students can, like, ask questions. Um, and the, you know, that person, the expert, wasn't, like, rating or grading the students. So. But how, was there a role in which you gave those that they could access just that discussion without accessing any of the Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, in my case, it was a I mean that Zoom person, session, so it was yeah, that session. person still was at at Western, so they still had, because like in Moodle, you can't like make it public outside of your institute. At least at Woo, you can't make it. Um, yeah, that's a good question though. Then you might have to move out of your LMS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, so anybody do the anonymous? I am curious. Oh yeah. <laughs> the anonymous. The only time I use anonymous is for. Uh, Questions and suggestions discussion forum. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that if they, you know, if they have a suggestion but they don't want to make it known, more yeah. surveyish kind of thing. Yeah, that's what I've done it for too. Yep. What would you? What do you want okay. to learn this term? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, assessing and managing. <laughs> Rubric time. Oh, I think it's the this is your one. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is really important is right from the get go, of course, your syllabus has got to have all this stuff on it. And um, I, I make sure that they, you know, a thousand times I'm saying, on the syllabus, you know, discussions are important in this course. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how formal they are. I have some students that are writing lowercase i's in the grad class. No. Um, I think that in those kinds of sessions, that's a no. Um, so talking about the formality of what you expect and whatever that might be is really important on the rubric. The second thing is netiquette. Um, we tend to get behind the screens and we can write whatever we want. And I, I let them know that you know words, word choice is important. And that um, for that reason, sometimes on some, I don't know, what do I want to call uh, topics that may push hot buttons, I make sure that those are audio only or video only posts because I want to hear your voice. So if, if, I, if you know already ahead of time that the right words may not be used in that discussion, then maybe that's something you want to do is, is have the recording there. So talking about netiquette, what you expect, and also as an instructor, I have the right of deleting your post, which I did um, last semester. A student wrote to another student, and it was a very um, kind of sexist comment. Hmm. And I just delete, sent that student a note um, about why I deleted it. And he was so apologetic because he said, oh, no, 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 this was about something we had done in a class last semester. And I know out of context it may have sounded weird and I, you know, then it was all cleared up. But you let them know that you'll do that. And, um, you know, it just says post deleted. Actually, was deleted this post. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what's going on right here? But um, talking about the quality that you have instead of just quantity. I had one student that was just like, scroll, scroll, scroll. <laughs> and I told her, don't do that. Next week, scroll, scroll. I'm like, Leslie, this is just too much. And so um, having an expectation about what the length of it should be is really important, the quality and quantity. If you, I have a friend, undergrads, provide like an example uh, because they aren't used to these kinds of posts. So yeah, not just this big long thing. Address the questions and be done with that. Nobody has time to read more than about, I always say, more than three paragraphs, I probably have stopped, stopped reading. Okay? I'm trying to make my questions not that long. Um, the accepted media formats that you will have, as Amy was discussing, the different types that you will have. Uh, citation rules. I don't know if this is a big deal for you, but like, if they make an opinion statement on there, or they take something from somebody else's website, or some paper, or journal, I say, you know, give, give citation credit, and I don't need to see the full APA at the bottom, but I want you to create a link to that document if you're, if you're, if you're staying, saying something. So putting that expectation in your rubric, um, specify um, the participation for peer replies. So we were just talking about that a moment ago. And my, mine is a post one is your response to my prompt. Post two is a question comment to another uh, student in the class about what they posted. And post three is you responding to that other person that posted something uh, with you. So there's a three post system in my class that's just showing that they're engaged in the discussion, the conversation, and if I've done the discussion question appropriately, hopefully that works out. And it's not every single week. That's an, that's an important thing. Um, so participation and peer replies, be very clear about what the years are. First one for me is 8 o'clock p.m. on Thursday. Uh, second one is uh, 8 p.m. by uh, Friday. And the last one is 8 p.m. by Sunday. And you get named a little point on my rubric if you're just a little bit late because when I first started teaching, I just had like a Sunday at 8 p.m. Well, when does everybody post? Mm -hmm. Sunday. 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 And then there's no way to post two or three. <laughs> and I explained that to them. I'm like, if we all do this and we all compress into that last two or three hours, then there's no discussion. There's no time for a discussion. So they get that pretty much right away. But post on this Thursday. And they get a little bang. It's not a lot to keep them out, but it's enough to keep some students from making sure they're getting in there to post. So, whoops, did that go? I, I clicked it because you were talking about your rubric, so I wanted to show. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we have a couple examples here of um, the example one is what I've done before, forum guidelines and syllabus, and then the second one here. Yeah, so if you want to, there's a link to my rubric there, and it talks about, you know, how I score them, the different points for a, a perfect, you know, exemplary, I won't say perfect, Exemplary response, <laughs> proficient, adequate, limited, and then a point for each thing. So my total points is 30. And Amy's was quite different. In fact, when I looked at hers, I said, do you really say half-assed on your group? <laughs> because she really did say that. Uh, um, but you want to talk about yours. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I'm trying to get more towards like labor-based grading. Um, and so I just have the, you don't post anything, you half-ass it, it's half credit. And if you post something, a couple paragraphs, and say something meaningful, full credit. I think this last time I taught, I gave everybody full credit. Because it was, you know, it doesn't have to be that, at least for, I mean, in my class, it's just a couple paragraphs, and you said something meaningful. It wasn't like this, you know, the kind of like wah, 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 wah paragraph, right? <laughs> you know what I call fluffy. The fluff. <laughs> you repeat my question. I say, don't repeat my question. You have some sort of fluffy thing, and you say something meaningless. You treat it like a Twitter, a blog post, or your Facebook page. This is for an academic conversation. I'm not bringing you into the space with that type of expectation. So back to the expectations. That's what's really important. And putting that on the rubric and giving crazy examples. I can't say half ass at my institution, but maybe you no. can say half <laughs> And that's, you've got that little graphic there. Oh, yeah. Asked half assed and asked. asked. <laughs> the boxes for what you have uh, for each one of those. Was that the next slide, or was there one back? The next one is feedback. Okay. So, making it personal, um, using you can use a generic comment. This is one of the things I do with, when I get a large class. And for me, a large class uh, last semester was thirty-two or not last semester, uh, no, the spring ago, thirty-two students in one, which is a lot for grad students. And um, wow, it was a lot for the, them. But I want them to know that I am reading every word. I do read every word, and I feel like if they spent that much time and I spend this much time. I'm so feeling guilty. Anybody else? <laughs> I don't like it. So what I do is I keep kind of a side note open, and I'll do the first one or two, and I'll start adding to that. I see some heads nodding. And then I'll have like some similar similarity in the first two sentences, a place where I can plug in some specific, like a sentence stem sort of thing, and then I can plug in their specific examples, and then a wrap for the last two. And this is the one that I really like to do. Um, uh, I will say to them, as I've shared or commented in my uh, reflection. So in my course, when it ends on Sunday night at 8 p.m., I sometimes go in and start looking at them then. But I will, come hell or high water, have that reflection posted by 4 o'clock the next day. And they know it. Um, and what that means is I now summarize each group's. And then I make one big summary reflection of that week's discussion. I wrap it up for them. It's, it's not like it was just like when I was in a grad class. It's like I discussed, we never saw it again, we never talked about it again. I didn't know if anybody made any good points. My professor didn't comment on any of that. I felt like out there. <laughs> so it, did, it had no meaning to me, and that's what we're trying to get away from. So my weekly reflection then was, uh, or is, very, very important. I don't like to travel on Mondays, but I, I would just then wrap up that discussion in usually about 10 or 20 minutes. But I'll say to them in my comments, in their posts, I'm going to use this example in my reflection. Or I am um, going to talk more about this concept. It might be a concept that several of them mentioned in my reflection. And they're like, oh, she's going to talk about my post and her reflection. And then I can go look at the analytics for that video that comes in that announcement about last week's discussion. And that really works for me. And I don't know if anybody else does that, but that, that really does help a lot. And they feel very committed that you paid that much attention to their reading by using that little kind of sentence demi thing and making those comments and then doing that, that verbal thing inside the video. So that weekly reflection is, um, what's the instructor instructions? Pull that all the way this up. Is, <laughs> this Absolute is my. <laughs> I already explained this. Um, open your form, read through the discussion post, copy and paste those snippets that you have that I just mentioned, uh, synthesize those snippets, and then use student names. Oh, that's a really important thing. So in my overview lectures for the week, don't mention the weather, as someone mentioned something the other day, right? Don't talk about anything. <laughs> call it. I, my first two years, I was constantly calling out student names. I'm like, oh, there's nobody named that in this class this semester. I need to remake this video. And um, so I'm very, I've got very vanilla on a couple of those, like the stats classes, but my size doesn't change. Um, but in the reflections, names, 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 names all over the place because they're ephemeral. They're just for that class. And they're not it to be short. So that's something that I do is really use their student names. And then post in next week's uh, uh, overview, the, at the beginning of the overview, that, um, hey, if you haven't checked out the reflection, go check it out. So I'm curious, do you um, participate in the discussion oh, forum like this question. while it's going on? <laughs> this is in our board. I don't. I mean, I, I have the, 
I don't. I monitor it, but I don't usually say anything. Although I did, I saw when I see a misconception in stats, like I did in one, I, I called it blue math. Um, I did enter that discussion because I didn't want it to go off rails. Um, but because it's grad for me, if I have my bias about that ahead of time, I am concerned that they just want to drink back to it. Um, so I monitor it for like erroneous weird stuff, but I don't usually join unless I see something really crazy. That that works for me. And uh, last night actually I jumped in there to see you know what was being said. Okay, everything feels kosher right now. Because then I find myself playing this game of constantly being in each one and making these comments where I really just want to reflect on what they say. They're graduate students, they have these thoughts and experiences, and I want, I'm challenging them to call it out on their own. That's my logic. Some people might say that's lazy. Um, for me, it's just, it works for me to not bias that. I also don't allow them to see each other's posts until they post. Um, again, to get their thoughts on these questions that we put in, hopefully in more provocative ways, having to business and all that sort of stuff. So, the one problem I've had with not being able to see um, anybody else's post until they post it is that there is a way around that. And that is to post. Oh, I know. Delete it. Oh. <laughs> I've been there, done that. <laughs> so, the good news about that is that you can see that this happened. Mm -hmm. I have a student, Audrey T. Um, <laughs> that did that. Okay. I saw it one week, I thought, well, that's an honest error. Saw it the second week, no. <laughs> uh, sent her a little message. Hey, Audrey, I noticed that this is taking place. Just as a reminder, you need to do this before this happens. Stop. So, um, yeah. It, but you can see it. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about that. So everybody's probably got their own opinion about that, but um, that's that's the way I run mine, and it works for me with the students that I have. And you'll have to decide if you really want to be in there all the time. I just find it to be almost overwhelming for me with all the other things that I do. But at least they know I write every word. At least I'm summarizing the main concepts, and I feel like that gets them to the learning of that content. Uh, anything else there? No, I'll have some and we show these examples. Oh yeah. So asking students, <laughs> just ask them on your midterm and final evaluation. How do you, you know, what do you like about the discussions? What don't you like? They'll tell you, you know. <laughs> it's 3 o'clock. Oh, okay. So we got to go through some of these other things. Okay. This one's fast anyway. So what are the other things that we can use when we don't want to use a discussion? And that's the question you got to ask yourself. I want to make sure they're doing the reading. I want them engaged in the course content. They watch the videos. If it this thing doesn't yield itself to a discussion, don't use that tool. We just threw up a bunch of balloons about a whole bunch of things you could use, case studies, concept maps. Have them just submit those either as groups to share with options to comment. Uh, create a concept web around this week's this week readings or whatever. I mean, I'm just throwing that out. But um, in my case, they're all educators. Can you, how would you construct the outline for a lesson plan on something like that? Is it an interview? Does it belong in the quiz? Is it just a simple video? What other ways can they demonstrate their understanding and be collaborative with that inside of the groups? So those are a whole bunch of different learning tools, and I think I've And there's a, a lot more, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a link yeah. in that slide um, that can send you to a whole bunch of other places. So the collaboration tools outside of the LMS, let's pull those Again, up. And there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of those that you sometimes have probably seen to use instead of a discussion tool. I get very bored with Utah State University's discussion board. Why? It's plain. Our color is dark blue, which looks black. So on our page in Canvas, it's black and white. <laughs> to me, it's really just ugly. And you know, I also require my students to put their little face icon. That's a requirement. Um, I won't grade it until you put your profile pic up. So they, that's some. I'm like, I won't grade it until I see your profile picture. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, so that helps a little bit, but it's boring. So sometimes just to break out of the walls of black and white boredom, I've used some of these other tools. One that I've used really, I found useful is Prezi. I like Prezi Classic, but since it's going away and it's flash based, I like Prezi Next. Um, <laughs> Prezi Next is okay. It's, any of you have used it, it's, got, it's, it's a little more complicated actually. But here's what I do. I have a discussion topic. Uh, I was using one called Emotional Learning. And in Emotional Learning, uh, there were all, this chapter they were reading, it had all these different concepts, and they were like, wow, super deep. And I'm like, how am I going to make a discussion question around this? So I grabbed the important concepts and put them in bubbles in Prezi. Then what I did is I took that one Prezi and copied it five times for five groups. 
Then I gave, I signed the groups, each one of them, um, like group one is these five people, group two is these five, so on and so forth, and then sent an invitation to them to join the Prezi, and now they were in a collaborative space for discussion. And they could post, I think I required three different things around different concepts. They could post a video they found that, that made sense of that concept, they could post a photo, a poem, whatever it was. But what was nice is at the end, when I went through each Prezi, it just flowed. I could just click, that's the next person's concept back. And then at the end of my reflection, I grabbed one of them, I thought was exemplary, and shared that with everybody because they're in their own discussion groups. So I used Prezi as a flow, if you will, for doing the discussion, and it worked really well. And it was pretty easy. I sent them a note saying, if you didn't get an invitation, something went wrong. Um, let me know if you are out. And those tools are all something that uh, I've used in those kinds of ways. Powtoon, any, any Web 2.0 tool that allows collaboration for 10 or less is point. an alternative. <laughs> Uh, is it an alternative to using your discussion form inside of your LMS? So and it's just more exciting. And students learn, in my case, they're educators. They can go out, they can probably use that tool in their own classroom. So now it's for our time for our fishbowl-ish. 15 uh, minutes. Yeah, fishbowl-ish kind of conversation that we wanted to have today because there are a lot of experts in this room. We are not experts. We are just sharing what works a little bit for us with the expectations. Um, and me because there's so much pushback from my own faculty about doing discussions. So, <laughs> we do really have these snacks from <laughs> Fishbowl. <laughs> and um, you're welcome to take, are they in there? Any good questions? They're in there. Oh, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> you have to take a snack, snack you first. You have questions, but Amy gets weird questions. I don't get these questions from the faculty <laughs> she works with. And students, too. And students. They're and students. So <laughs> you can pull some of these out unless you've got some specific ones. They're sort of funny. Um, and maybe have a discussion about what works for you in a discussion that we haven't really mentioned. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> okay? Okay, so would you like some bolts? Oh. Or Swedish fish. <laughs> you like Swedish fish? All right, let's see what this part is. All right. Here we go. Uh, how do I possibly read and make meaningful comments on all of these as an instructor? Okay. I give you my opinion. Anybody else have another way to deal with meaningful, com uh, meaningful uh, comments in the class? Anything else that you do? The internet's are all I mean, you can't comment. I mean, I guess you could, but that seems cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not realistic. <laughs> I comment on all of them because it's usually 25 or less. Um, anybody else? Anybody with big classes? What do you do? Oh, I have big classes. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, you come on every single one. Yeah, I do. And so, um, so part of like what like you did, you know, I get a pattern in the first few. I get a sense, and I do open that. So I do actually what you do. Mm -hmm. And um, and there, I usually have in the the three or five questions or prompts I have, one that really, really matters. Like some are sort of giveaway questions. Because uh, I just want them to engage each other in a meaningful way. But one that I'm particularly looking at, and that's the one that I pay a lot of attention to. Like I would, I, I, I may not be able to read all of them, but I'll definitely read so, some. So let me give more detailed comments. The other ones are a little bit shallower. Well, I'll, I'll actually choose among the, the prompts, like you know, the three to five prompts. Okay. There is one in there that matters the most in that class. Like that's the part that I want the critical thinking. So that's the one I pay a lot of attention to. But the other ones are opinions, like you know, mm -hmm. um, share your thoughts about this. You know, but that one question about this particular subject, I pay attention to. Yeah. And so that one, I'll actually pick a comment that they had, I'll copy and paste that onto comments and quotes, and then I'll comment on that one. And so, but one of the things that I've heard you say, which I, I'm going to think about adopting, is really doing the overall reflection. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Mm -hmm. And naming folks and you know, spreading the love across the term so I get to everyone. So I'll have to think yeah, about Yeah, and you could select just one group that you, that you thought and then kind of make sure that kind of goes around. I, I randomized the group selection too. Mm -hmm. Somebody said that, you know, all was a uh, flower, you know, making sure that, you know, she never responded to me. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about that. I do keep a mental tally, but I might actually keep, like, did I miss somebody? Um, I might be good to keep that tally, but I'm pretty good and pretty consistent. And, of course, we always have all-stars in the class, right? It's always like, 
kind of follow a few others in there that you're like, okay, I can read their response first because it's going to be easy to sound great. Okay, then <laughs> I'm not saying anything y'all don't do, right? Um, but the thing is, is that, um, yeah, that's, ex that's exactly why I do it and I try and remember who they are and make a mental note of that. So one approach one could take is to not grade any of the discussions during the semester. Um, but instead, you're reading them as you go, and you can send an email to the student to say, that was a really good post, and here was my feedback on that, blah, 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 blah. Then at the end of the semester, you ask the students to go back through all of their discussions and write a reflection on the most salient discussions they have. And then you grade that. I have. He did something close to that, I'll throw that out there as my gift. She taught a class on curriculum theory. And she had the first day she said to them, um, write your definition of how we develop curriculum. Like, what's the theory of curriculum? That was like week one. And they all wrote what they thought they knew about it. Went through 15 weeks. Her final final is to go back and look at your post for first week, same question. Very reflective on 15 weeks of stuff. And they were like astounded that they, they shocked themselves. <laughs> I thought I knew what, what it really was. I didn't really think about the hidden curriculum, all the different concepts that she had discussed. For me as a person who looked at the instructors, I was like, evaluation, check. You know, she really was evaluating through using that discussion tool while kind of pre post. So there's another one that's kind of a build up of what you're, you're talking about. But probably say a little bit more. Right. Oh, maybe we better drop a couple more. Yeah, Anybody else? Yeah, you have a question? Yep. Go ahead and pick some up. Oh, you have oh, a question. I, okay. I'm just curious, like, what are some alternatives? Maybe you guys have tried with larger classes. I know in the past I've struggled. I had, like, 50, 60 students, and there was no way I could like, respond to even half of them. I'm just curious to see. So for my, yeah, so um, through my instructors, they do, they have 80 plus students. And so what I tell them, and they feel really guilty about it that they aren't going through and you know reading them all and commenting on them all and they, they do they feel really guilty so I say don't do that don't do that at all just do the weekly reflection that's what I tell them you say don't feel guilty about it you're reading them you know it doesn't take too much time to read through them all but then you're still doing that kind of synthesis you're using student names that takes you maybe an hour on a Sunday that's what I tell them to do I think also with large enrollment, you can break students into groups, and it's mm -hmm. kind of a call-out Yeah, focus on just one group that week. Say I'm randomly going to select a group to use my reflection this week, and then say you've graded everybody, but let them know that you're going to be selecting a group and they don't know which one it's going to be. I see that as well. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah. Okay. There was a pathophysiology course at Boise State with 330 students. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and so they they broke it up into several groups with a TA each. Oh. Um, but the professor did do the I'm going to choose a random group, and you never know which time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose mm -hmm. yep. um, I've seen instructors like put a, a lead facilitator on the group to kind of allow the students to get to that. Mm -hmm. But then you're not the person sort of facilitating the conversation, you're still doing a synthesis to wrap up, but it's sort of encouraging them. And I think they then maybe participate differently because they know they're going to be in the seat where they're hoping people are responding, so they <laughs> can kind of feel the pain of they like, hey, what's, happening? what's happening? And I also one time had an instructor email me one time to say, like, thank you for mm -hmm. how you're participating in the discussion and continuing the conversation going. And so I felt like as a student that gave me more Other strokes. <laughs> yeah, can you, can you do that? Because I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm overstepping or what, you know, so it's helpful to have an instructor say, like, actually, that's helpful, and, and please continue to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you can name a couple that are, like, keeping the fuel in. Um, Anyone else? You should take that and pass it. Guys, really, we're not taking these snacks back with us. Take them and eat them. Just pass them around and eat the snacks until you run into a piece of paper. Anybody else have anyone? Or you have a lot of piece of paper next that we have? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it says, um, these responses suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, I hear that from instructors. So I'll, well, I'll hear them in their office. They're like, ah, what are you saying? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Comments from people. What? Have you ever heard of that? Turn to like webcams, students <coughs> responding to what instructors put in and instructors. They can both see, because I feel like I also hear from students like, oh. yep, it's so it's, she has another way to say the same, same thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> These responses suck. that as a student, yep. <laughs> I think connecting to expectations. Are you going to add on to that? Oh, I have a separate question. So oh, okay. I think I'll just say expectations is really, really important, and then reminding that student by using that rubric. Yeah. But that's not quite going to be closer. That's like a fly in the spot, right? I was just I was going to say that having a rubric and, and posting that it, we're Blackboard School, so you can view the rubric when you open up the mm -hmm. discussion. Canvas does the same thing. I would assume yeah. it does. Um, so make sure that they know that that's there. And it's it's not always intuitive for students to find some of those things. So make sure that they know where to find the rubrics and they know exactly what criteria they're going to be um, assessed on. It really enables them to be successful up front. So not guessing. I, I mean, I, I, it's totally that yeah. That expectation. They have to know rubric. what expectations yeah. are. It only takes one week of low scores though. Then they go, oh, what was yeah. I supposed to do? Or and having an, an example format almost in you know, mm -hmm. talking about whether it's in your syllabus or like in your first week or when you're discussing how that goes. Some of our faculty, I'm not an instructional, I don't teach myself, but I'm an instructional designer, but just like, hey, if this is the kind of expect, if this is the kind of course that I'm looking for, here's what it might look like with a sample response. So, you know, just five or six sentences of, you know, you can fill in the blank here with know what's appropriate for the topic of the week, but it should be in a format similar to this. Yes, I, I, I comment on that too. Is when I do, um, in some of my classes I have two discussions a week, and so I will go in and respond to every single student during the first few weeks of the term in one discussion a week, and I try to model what mm -hmm. I'm grading them on in the rubric. I, and I'll I, say, I, Oh, you didn't refer to an outside article, but I found one, and here's, here's my blah, blah, blah about this article. I'm sure you can do this in your next discussion, and I'll do that publicly to try to show them. Sort of covert, but not really. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty direct. Yeah. And, then they, uh, and they have a chance to fix it, too. Mm -hmm. Dr. General, uh, what do you think of Sorry, somebody said it and I didn't hear it from back here, but what do you think of doing that sort of general comment for the class as a video or a podcast? Would that, would that help me? The reflection? The reflection, I'm sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's, you do it as yeah. a video. I do that for video or for podcast. Are you asking what everybody else thinks about that? Yeah, I'm just wondering how that's worked for folks. Has anybody else done that? Mm -hmm. Just try. Is, you know, it's, 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 don't worry about what we look like, but it's really more about the sound, right? Mm -hmm. And do we have to then do a transcript of that because it's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she asked, how, how do I know that they're on that page? First of all, you can track the analytics on the page of the announcement whether students have seen it. And then also, if, if you put that video inside of, depending on what you're using, I, you can even do it in YouTube, you can see how many sure. times it was open. Um, I was thinking about using the book grid that way, or the book grid, um, Ed puzzle. I went to a couple sessions here on Ed puzzle, and I thought, "Ooh, I think that's what my reflection is." Ed puzzle. Mm -hmm. I mean, just some different ways to track some things like that. But there are some different analytics to take a look at. Um, but I tell you, telling them that you're calling your name out in your reflection is really like gets their attention. So it's a good way to do that. Did you say that you approach your reflection as an announcement rather than as an additional? Yeah, I do because that, otherwise they don't get that. Um, Notifications, no, no. and it's just. I wish there was a different quote like the word announcement. I wish it said reflection, but it doesn't. So it says you know, announcement. I say reflection for week six of the title or whatever it might be. And uh, do you normally put students in groups for discussion forums? I don't like to read more than. I don't like having more than five students in a discussion. It's like it, it's clunky and it's wash growing. So four is nice. Five is max. 
does that mean that they can only read the posts within that group, or can they still read the entire class post if they have? Uh, that, I, I use Canvas, yeah. and to my knowledge, they can only stay in that group. But somebody was using some other LMS mm -hmm. I heard here, but they can, you can skip yeah, out and go check into someone else's, and I thought, wow, that's cool. But 